better, much, much better. Looks really, really good all week long watching them do the work, and it just kept getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And I was like, man, this is really, really nice. So uh, thank you to those who came out last night. I think there were 29 that came out to help uh, put the chairs back in their exact spot. It took us about 45 minutes, so it was, it was awesome. But I really appreciate that and all the work that Jeff has done to make this worship center uh, a great place to be. Uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to talk about when opportunity knocks. When Kendra and I were first married, we, we lived in a horrible house. Um, and we were, one night, we were just kind of going through, sorting through all the things that we were bringing together. Uh, and we were just going through some stuff. And I ran across this white tub. It was about the size of a casserole dish, but it was a hard plastic tub with a blue lid. And I was like, well, what's this? And she said, oh, it's just, just some medals and stuff from school. And I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I knew that she had done sports in, in high school and things like that. But when I opened the lid, I mean, there, it was full of all these medals from track and basketball and first place, second place, third place, you know, third place, not third base, third place. Um, you know, me and my, my sports lingo, I'm really uh, super at that. But we were just going through, and I was like, you are fantastic. And she really was. She was at the top of her game in high school. I'm going to be in big trouble for saying all this. Um, I didn't ask her about it. But she was at the top of her game and still has records that are still set to this day in Sterling City. So it was a big deal. But we were going through, and there were a couple of letters. There was a letter there from uh, the Junior Olympics. She had qualified for the Junior Olympics. And so I was reading that and asking her about why she didn't do it and heard the whole story. It's a little long, so I'll say that. I have 25 minutes. Um, but then I ran across this other letter that was addressed to her from Brown University, inviting her to Brown University to talk to the recruiter about a scholarship for her to go play track at Brown University. And I read the letter and I said, this is a letter from Brown University. And she shot me her very famous Captain Obvious look and was like, uh, yeah. And I was like, this is Brown University. This, this is an Ivy League school. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Why, you went to Oklahoma Christian? You didn't go to Brown University? I didn't know about anything about Ivy League schools or anything like that. And I was like, oh, my word. You know, this is Brown. And it still gets me keyed up to this day talking about it. It's been, what, a <laughs> hundred years since we've been in college and out. But, you know, it was just this incredible opportunity. And, of course... Uh, her life would be blessed when, where she went to Oklahoma Christian because she wouldn't have found me, you know, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but it was a missed opportunity. Don't we all know about missed opportunities? Some opportunities don't have a lot of eternal consequences, but some opportunities do. In his book, Just As I Am, Billy Graham was writing about the time at the 1963 National Prayer Breakfast that he met John F. Kennedy he had met him a few months earlier whenever he was on the campaign trail and had just been announced for the nomination to be president. And they had a very long talk about salvation and a deep discussion about, about salvation compared to his faith Catholicism and what Billy Graham believed about, about salvation. And they just didn't have time to kind of flesh out all that discussion. But at the 1963 National Prayer Breakfast, one of the coldest days on record, they were outside walking to the limo together, and President Kennedy stopped and turned to Mr. Graham and said, Would you like to come back to the White House so I, because I would like to, to talk to you for a little bit? Unfortunately, that was a bitter cold day, and Billy Graham was in the throes of the flu, and he was just feeling horrible. And he said, Mr. President, there's just no way that I can go back to the White House and ride in the limo with you. I've got the flu. I feel horrible. I don't want anyone else to get this. I think I just better go home. And President Kennedy pressed and pressed and asked, him, are you sure you don't want to go back? Are you sure you don't want to go back to the White House? And he said, no, I really, I really have to say I'm sorry. I just can't do it. I just don't want to get anyone sick, and I just don't feel well. So President Kennedy reluctantly said, okay, I understand. We'll talk again another time. Little did he know that a few short months later, President Kennedy would be assassinated, and he would never have that other time. And he writes in his book, and he says that it was um, one of the, excuse me, excuse me, 
one of the most regrettable things he ever decided to do in his whole life. Um, so for him, he carried that burden his whole life because he missed that opportunity to talk about his faith and to share that. Missed opportunities. So when opportunity knocks, what do we do? The Father gives us many opportunities each day. You know, he may open the door for us to encourage a waiter or waitress. He may open the door for us to give someone who's going through a difficult time some encouragement. Or, or someone who's in doubt, we can reassure them. But one thing's for sure, he gives us opportunities every day. God gives us the ability to see these doors open. He gives us an opportunity to, to work. He gives us an opportunity to have a family, to attend church, to earn a living, to have, to have these relationships with others. We each have our own circle of influence. We each know our own bubble of people. And we are given opportunities every day to share our faith, to glorify God, to lift others up. And so we have to learn how to see those opportunities. By definition, an opportunity is only available to us for a limited time. So how do we make sure that we're not missing out on all these opportunities that God has put before us? Our text this morning is going to come out of John chapter 9. If you want to turn there uh, in your Bibles, that would be great. We'll be there most of, this, most of the rest of the morning. But our text this morning comes out of John chapter 9, where we read about a blind man who was the son of Timaeus, named Bartimaeus, a blind beggar who experienced Jesus in a very unexpected way. His sight was restored to him in part because he paid attention to what was happening around him. He saw the opportunity and he took advantage of it. We too can be very sensitive to what's going on around us. We too can learn how these opportunities come and learn not to ignore the gentle nudgings of the Holy Spirit when He gives us opportunity to share our faith. So what do we need to do to be sensitive to what God is doing around us so that we don't miss what He has in store for our lives? In John chapter 9, verse 1, John introduces Bartimaeus to us with these words. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Bartimaeus never saw a sunrise. Bartimaeus never saw a sunset. He couldn't tell green from red. He didn't know what his mother's face looked like. He had been blind from birth. In that time, people thought that you must have had some type of sin, either a sin that you committed or a sin that your parents committed, but there was something that had to happen for you to be put in that situation. And so verse 2 we read, The disciples turned to Jesus and said, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he would be born blind? Jesus replied, neither. Verse 3, trace the condition back to heaven. The response was that he was this way so the works of God might be displayed in him. Let that verse 3 wash over you. So the works of God might be displayed in him. Selected to suffer. There are those who have incredible abilities to sing, which I do not possess. Some have an incredible ability to teach God's Word. But talk about a thankless role, selected to suffer, chosen before eternity to be the one who would be blind and faced with this opportunity at this time. Who wants to be blind for God's glory. So which is tougher as you weigh out Bartimaeus and his story? Which would be tougher? To know that you have this condition of blindness from birth or to discover that it was God's idea? Just like Bartimaeus, we come into our lives faced with opportunities because we come to a, a providential crossroads a lot. But we're often unaware of them because we haven't learned to tune in to how the Holy Spirit's working and talking and tapping us on the shoulder. And this is why we have to be sensitive to the work of the Spirit in our life. So how do we sharpen those spiritual skills? How do we get to a place where that gentle nudge, that tap on the shoulder, that thought that comes in your mind of the person randomly, where you begin to react and you call that person and say, you were on my heart today, and I just want to call and say, I love you. How are you doing? 
It's that gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to be aware. So how do we get there? How do we sharpen that? First, we have to spend time with the Word. We have to spend time with the Lord. Observe how the Lord worked in the lives of the people of the Old and the New Testament. Read those stories. Learn those interactions. See that Jesus was a relational person. He could have cared less about what you knew. He wanted you to know Him. It was about the relationship. Observe how the Lord worked in those lives of all the Old Testament and New Testament characters. Be assured that that work continues in us today through the Holy Spirit so that you can be sensitive to the voice inside you guiding you to make a difference. And so as we learn how God operates, as we learn how those gentle taps on the shoulder give you opportunity to share your faith or glorify your faith, just like Bartimaeus, we shouldn't miss the opportunity. Bartimaeus was blind. He was a beggar. I believe from this scripture and others that we'll read this morning, he was abandoned by his family. He was completely outcast by his society. He could have easily believed his fate. He could have easily sat at that gate and thought, I am a worthless piece of flesh. I have no idea why God put me here. I have no idea why God gave me what he gave me. I have no idea why I'm here. He could have been bitter. He could have been angry. He could have been lashing out. He could have easily believed it was impossible for him to write another story. But he had the faith to take a chance on the healing power of Jesus. But Bartimaeus chose to have hope. And that is our choice today, to choose to have hope. He made a decision to stand out. Every crossroads calls for a decision. Just like when two people are at, an, at the scene of an accident or somewhere and you ask them to tell the story, you always get different perspectives of the same story. If you hold your place in John 9 and flip over to Mark chapter 10, let's get another side of that story. Mark chapter 10 gives us a different perspective. If you look in Mark 10 verse 47, we read that as the disciples were walking in the crowded streets, when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, Bartimaeus began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Louder and louder as the crowd around him began to kick him and tell him to shut his mouth. As they began to tell him to know his place, others in the crowd tried to hush him, but Bartimaeus began to persist. He was saying it louder and louder and louder, and Jesus replied to this poor man, he heard him, and his reply to this poor man for mercy shows us one thing. God hears you when you cry out. Amen. Jesus, was on, excuse me. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way to celebrate his very, his very last Passover his very last time on this earth before he would be crucified. To say that he was a little preoccupied, to say that Jesus had bigger fish to fry, to say that he had not a plate but a platter full of trouble is an understatement. But he stopped for this blind beggar. He made it a point to pause the execution of the eternal purpose of man to talk to a poor blind beggar. An important journey for Bartimaeus and an important journey for Jesus because he would be willing to listen. When the Savior called Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10 verse 50 says, he threw off his cloak and ran to him. That cloak was a prized possession. It was likely the only possession that Bartimaeus had. And if anything in Scripture shows that Bartimaeus was willing to throw off everything in his past life to run toward that Savior and run toward that new hope. This verse, the throwing off of his cloak and him running to Jesus, shows he hung on to the hope of Jesus and the future he had in Jesus, not the assurance of his past of being an outcast. He knew how that story ends. 
He knew how that day would play out. But he saw the opportunity, and he wanted to write a new story. Notice that Jesus asked Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, verse 51, What do you want me to do? What is it exactly you need for me to do, Bartimaeus? Do you realize that whenever we come to those crossroads in our faith, do you realize that whenever Jesus puts something on your heart and puts you at a crossroads, that that's the very question he's asking? What do you want me to do? Just like Bartimaeus, he wants you to tell him what you need. Talk to the Father and tell him what you need. Nobody is insignificant in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that Bartimaeus said, I want to see. Jesus wants to speak to you because he loves you. Jesus wants to speak to you because he desires for you to have a relationship with him. He desires for you to use your life to glorify him, to praise him here on earth. The world abounds with paintings of Jesus. If you think about all the paintings of Jesus in the arms of Mary as a baby, can you picture that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, I can picture that. In the Upper Room, I can picture that. In the Darkened Tomb, I can picture that. We see paintings all the time of Jesus touching, of Jesus weeping, of Jesus laughing and teaching, but I've never once seen a picture or a painting of Jesus spitting. Have you? I haven't. And yet in this story, we see Jesus encountering Bartimaeus, who is blind from birth. What do you want? I want to see. And we see Jesus smacking his lips a time or two, gathering a mouthful of saliva, dropping it down into that dirt, and using his finger and crouching down. Not the, last, not the first time that he's crouched down in a pile of dirt to write something profound. Crouches down and begins to work that saliva and the clay together to make a paste. Gets enough gathered up that he can put it in his hands. Stands up. I can just see it. Putting a smear on both hands and going across Bartimaeus' face. Covering his face with that clay. And then he says, verse 7. John chapter 9, verse 7. We're back to John. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the beggar feels his way to the fountain. He knows the way. He's memorized every step he's ever taken. He makes his way to the fountain, splashes water on his mud-streaked face, and rubs the clay away. And immediately he sees. It wasn't blurry for a little bit. It wasn't hazy. And then it was sharp, crystal clear sight immediately as soon as he washed his face. Immediately he sees for the first time. And he has his sight back. Our scripture reading this morning was Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I like the way the King James words it. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I love the last three words, so that we would walk in them. We have a story to tell. We have a life to live. And we walk through crossroads every day. And what Paul wants us to do is to walk in them and know that we are the workmanship of Christ, created for this opportunity. So in other words, if we read this Ephesians statement, in other words, the Lord creates opportunities for you to fulfill His plan and His purpose for your life, for eternity. But what is your responsibility? Do you have a responsibility? When Jesus took that clay and wiped it on Bartimaeus' face, what did he say to do? He didn't say you're immediately clean. What did he say? Go to the pool of Siloam. So when you're faced with an opportunity, your job is to step into the opportunity. Step into the opportunity. Ask yourself what God has already done for you. He will not give you opportunities that he knows you are incapable of fulfilling. He will give you everything you need with the Holy Spirit's help to carry out His purpose for your life. And so when you're at a crossroads, 
when you have a crossroads in your life, the decision you need to make is do I step into that opportunity and walk in faith knowing that God is there or do I leave it there and not do it? This church faced an incredible opportunity. We were trying to figure out branches, doing a pretty good job, growing, thriving. Word was getting out about this church in Tulsa that has not one, not two, but three branches. And then this opportunity comes about a piece of property called Grace. And our leadership at the crossroads of a decision didn't leave it there. Could they? Yes. But they decided to see what was there. And so they stepped into the opportunity. And they began to ask God specific questions to show and reveal that this is the plan, that this is the way. We think it's a crazy, unbelievable, how in the world could you be thinking this idea? We weren't. God was. That in obedience we stepped into the opportunity and God began to unfold His glory. Don't give up, even when you're criticized. When others don't understand exactly what you're going through with the Lord as you wrestle through the crossroads of your life, don't give up whenever others criticize you. Let's look at the reaction. John, again, back in John. Look at the, re the reaction of the neighbors. Verse 9. Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Look, it's Bartimaeus. It's Bartimaeus. He can see. Why is he jumping around? Why is he dancing around? Others were saying, oh, it's Bartimaeus. But still we're like, no, 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 it couldn't be Bartimaeus. There's no way he could be seeing. He's been blind from birth. I've been stepping over him his entire life. I've ignored him every single day of his entire life. But Bartimaeus kept saying, I'm the one. I'm the one. It's me. It's me. These people knew him. They knew his mom and dad. They watched his mom walk down those same streets carrying him in her womb. They knew him. And when he receives this miracle, who is this guy? They didn't celebrate, they debate. They've watched this man, verse 23. They knew who he was. You think they would rejoice, but they don't. They march him to the church to have this trial before the Pharisees. When the Pharisees ask for an explanation in verse 15, the was blind beggar says, Jesus applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. That was simple math for him. Jesus expressed need, action, result. I got a miracle. But the Pharisees, again, didn't applaud. They didn't pause for applause. They didn't say, well, what a great thing. Surely this is the Son of God. They were trying to get rid of him, not proclaim him. Apparently, Jesus can, failed to consult the healing handbook because he had violated Scripture. Verse 14 and 16 say, Now it was a Sabbath on that day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. He doesn't keep the rules that we keep. Is no one going to rejoice with Bartimaeus? Is he going to be the only person on the planet who's going to rejoice in this miracle? The neighbors didn't. The preachers didn't. Let's see. His parents, they're coming. Bartimaeus is going to see his mother's face for the first time in his life. Now, that would be exciting, wouldn't it? The parents were called to come see the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son? Is this the one that you say was blind from birth? Is this the beggar that you know that you've cast out of your family? There, there, there. Then how does he see? How can he do this? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son. We know he was born blind. And now he sees. 
We do not know how or who opened his eyes. We do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. In other words, we want nothing to do with this boy. The fear of social isolation, the fear of being thrown out by their church, caused his parents to abandon him. Verses 19 through 22 unveil all of that. But how could they do this? How could those parents... You know, that's pretty serious business to be thrown out of the synagogue. That's pretty serious. But isn't refusing your child even more? No one saw Bartimaeus that day. So who in this great story about blind Bartimaeus, who really was blind that day? The neighbors didn't see the man. They saw a novelty. The church leaders didn't see the man. They saw a technicality. The parents didn't see their son. They saw an embarrassment. They saw yet another humiliation from the son of Timaeus. So in the end, no one saw him. And verse 34 says, they put him out. Put him back where they found him. Outcast. Don't give up when you're criticized and doubted. Be a person who takes advantage of every God-given, God-given opportunity. Jesus' walk through Jericho was not just an opportunity for Bartimaeus. Jesus' walk through Jericho was the opportunity for himself. It was the last time the Lord would walk by. It was the last time he would walk those streets before he would be crucified. For Bartimaeus, this was his one moment and he seized the opportunity. He stepped into the opportunity and changed his life forever. What doors open right now for you? Are you at a crossroads this morning? What doors stand open for you right now that you may one day have shut behind you forever? Are you struggling with some? Are you willing to do whatever the Lord asks of you to get that done? Or maybe there's some need that you have. Maybe there's something you desire of the Lord. Are you willing to ask Him for it? As children of God, there are new promising roads for us to take every day. We just have to tune into that. We have to decide, do we believe Him? Do we believe that stepping into an opportunity to be obedient to the Lord is greater than the future that I have if I don't? Stepping into an opportunity. Do we want to explore what God has to offer? Take advantage of the unique and exciting opportunities planned just for you. And know that God will never leave you. Know that you will never be abandoned. Know that you will never be cast out. How do we know? Well, in case the stable birth wasn't enough, if three decades of earth walking and miracle working is insufficient, if there's any doubt regarding... God's full bore devotion to you. He does things like this. He stops for a beggar and changes his life forever. He tracks down a troubled pauper. If he'll do that for Bartimaeus on the most critical, important day of his life, he'll do that for you. Jesus will come for you where you are. And we see the beggar lifting his eyes to look into the face of the one who started it all. Is he going to criticize Christ? Is he going to be super angry at him because you made me blind? Because you healed me? Look what you've done to me. Is he going to complain? Is he going to be angry? You can't blame him for doing any of those things. After all, he didn't volunteer for the disease or the deliverance. But with verse 38, we see that Bartimaeus, whenever he comes to see Christ face to face, he does none of that. He falls down and he worshiped him. And when you see him, when you see that you step into the opportunity and you're walking out your faith and you're being obedient to God's way, not your way, we worship him. Just as he came for the blind man, he's coming for you. The hand that touched the blind man's shoulder can touch your cheeks. 
The face that changed his life can change your life. You may relate to Bartimaeus all too well. I know I can. Broken marriages, lives wracked with addiction, hearts crying out to be blessed to have the opportunity to be a parent, cancer, health records with prognosis that have a horrible outcome, health records as thick as a phone book. We can relate to Bartimaeus. These are things that are happening in this church house today, right now. These are things that are going on. Is it the de disease or is it the deliverance? God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through. We have all of these things. And you may be saying, oh, how in the world could so-and-so, how could they be put into that? How could they be going through that? How can you fill in the blank? And we have the answer. So the works of God might be glorified. When you're at a crossroads... When you face things that you cannot imagine having a human face, when your heart is breaking, when your life is breaking, when you're crying out to the Lord, what is going on? He will come for you. Jesus knows. He knows how you feel. When he heard that Bartimaeus had been thrown out, verse 35, he went and found him. He will come for you. And your dilemma, your catastrophe, whatever you're going through in your life, puts you at a crossroads. Step into the opportunity so that the works of God might be glorified. He's looking for you today. He's waiting for you to step out of your comfort zone. He's waiting for you to step into the opportunity because this world needs to be a better place. Because this world needs to know that there's a church that's not afraid to walk into a new adventure and give God all the glory. There are people who we know right now that can come up here and proclaim how they were at a crossroads and they stepped into the opportunity and they are healed and God has blessed their life and they are living proof that God will be glorified. We're a hot mess church. If you're visiting with us today, we are not perfect. We are a hot mess. But we love the Lord and we love you. And you will find people who come alongside you on your walk and will not leave you. And that's the good thing about this church. So today, if you have a need, if you have an opportunity that you need help with in responding, this is your chance as we stand and sing.